Good morning, God's people. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful that you have joined us today as we go through the Bible, as it is our custom here at Calvary Chapel. And we thank you for making the time to come and fellowship. Um, If you are here last Sunday, uh, Josh mentioned that he won't be around this Sunday, but he will be back in the course of the week. So we are grateful for his travels and ministry out there. Would you pray for him in your private time? that the Lord will always lead and guide and grant wisdom. We are going to go straight to our text today that is in the book of Philemon, depending with where you come from, Philemon or Philemon. And we are going to ask ourselves a few questions as we go through this very short letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. And maybe a few things to keep in mind as we are going to go through it. You know, does... Does brotherly love really exist in our lives or as believers today, even in situations of extraordinary tension and difficulties? You know, will it work when we are trying to pursue it and the other parties are not willing to work it out? Does this thing really, really work? That is what we are going to get in this very profound letter that was written to Philemon with the Apostle Paul. And really it brings us to a daily walk with Jesus Christ, our Christian's daily walk. Jesus said, you remember, that if you love one another, the world will know that you are indeed my disciples. And that calls us to really discipline ourselves and to love one another as Christ. So this letter to Philemon was written during one of Paul's many imprisonment letters. It is the shortest letters that we see from Paul. But this cannot, you know, make you think that maybe because it's just, you know, like a chapter... We, we don't have a lot of things to draw from it. That should not trick you. This is actually one of the most explosive things that Paul ever composed, and we are going to see it. And from what we gather, before we get into the text, Philemon was a very wealthy Roman citizen from Colossae. He likely met Paul during his mission in Ephesus, as recorded in Acts chapter 19, where he became a follower of Jesus Christ. When Paul's co-worker, Epaphras, started a fellowship in Colossae, Philemon became a leader of a church that was based in his home. And Philemon, like any or all other household patriarchs in the Roman world, enslaved people. And one of whom was named Onesimus. And at some point, these two had a serious conflict. Onesimus wronged Philemon in some way, or perhaps by theft or cheating. Whatever exactly happened, it was made worse when Onesimus ran away. Eventually, this man, Onesimus, was 
probably in prison or visited Paul in prison, likely to appeal for help. And there he became a follower of Jesus Christ and a beloved assistant to Paul. And here Paul will find himself in a very difficult and a delicate situation as he writes this letter. He wants Philemon not to simply forgive Onesimus, but also receive and embrace him as a brother in the Lord. In other words, Paul is asking Philemon to release Onesimus from enslavement and treat him equal with the followers of Jesus Christ. And historians will tell us that by this time, there were over 60 million slaves within the Roman Empire, a number far greater than free people. Many of them became slaves through wars or born in slavery or orphaned by circumstances or some just willingly chose to become slaves. So you'd find a lot of slaves in people's homes. There were so many. That at least would help us with the background of what is gonna happen in our text today. Here in verses one, Philemon, Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the beloved Ephia, our keepers, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and towards all his saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. God, we ask of your presence. We ask of clarity as we read your word this morning. We pray that if be there any situation in our hearts that relates to our text today, the Lord, you'd help us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in us that will hearken to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This short letter, as we see, Paul begins with a prayer of thanksgiving. And the man who is going to receive this letter does not know really, you know, the content of the letter. All he knows, he's received a letter from a fellow brother in the Lord and his Paul, well-respected man and had a good testimony. And at this time, he's in prison. And he writes a letter to Philemon because of what has happened in the life of Onesimus, who was um, a slave to this man. Very bad testimony. He was a thief. <laughs> he stole things, or he cheated. He did a lot of bad stuff. You know, we, we don't like bad people, right? You guys ever sat in a movie just watching a movie? You always want the bad people to die, right? To kill them. And if they... They try and get away, you know, they drive away so fast. They're like, something should just happen and, uh, you know, someone should just blow them. They should die for what they do. We crave for this, (laughs) 
you know, revenge. We want to see them finished. I don't know if that was Philemon's prayer to see Onesimus finished. He's wronged him. He's done a lot of bad things. And Paul here begins brilliantly and very humbly saying, you know, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus Christ. And this also should send a message to Philemon that him being a master... He understands this kind of authority, how it works. He's a boss to some, some of these guys. He has prisoners with him. He says this and they follow. Some of them maybe willingly gave themselves up to be prisoners, to be slaves. And this is different. Paul says, I am a prisoner. These people met in prison. Paul and Onesimus with different circumstances surrounding them. Paul is in prison because he's serving the Lord. <laughs> this other one is in prison because he's, he's offended the law and the law needs to take its part in his life. And he addressed Philemon, beloved friend and a fellow laborer. And also he mentions two people here, Aphia and Akipas other sources from the church fathers tells us probably Ephia was Philemon's wife and Akipas his son. That is why probably they are addressed straight away. So that, you know, when this man offended Philemon, the offense was for a family, right? <laughs> you offend the husband, you offend the entire family. <laughs> and when he's addressing them, through the wisdom granted to the Lord, he wants their hearts to be softened. He mentioned them first and then I say the grace, grace of the Lord and peace of our God be with you. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Now friends, it is very easy for us to mention a general prayer, right? We're going to pray for Calvary Chapel Eldoret. We're going to pray for Kenya. We're going to pray for China. Pray for America. A very general prayer is easy to make. But these intimate prayers, praying for people, mentioning them via their names, and consistently doing that, that is very powerful. How, how do you feel when you know that there's someone who says, hey, I have been praying for you. Every day of my life, I think about you and I pray for you. That, in a way, begins to break the walls. The man, this guy is in prison. We are supposed to be the ones praying for you, but you're busy praying for us. Begins with the prayer of thanksgiving. Thanking God for the love and faithfulness Philemon has shown towards God's people towards Jesus and his people. And by this, Paul starts to pave the way for his request in this dance line. He said that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing in you in Christ Jesus. Reminding him that every good thing that happens to you, that every good thing that you can ever do proceeds out of Christ. You, you don't love Christ and these people because, you know, you just want to do it. You know, you're, you're born that way. <laughs> you know, sometimes people will help people. You're like, you know, I was just born that way. I was born kind. <laughs> I just love people. And I. I just care about people. You know what the Bible tells us? 
that our righteousness is as what? Filthy rugs. <laughs> that is what the Bible says. So don't, don't you think for one second that whatever good things you're doing, you're doing because you, know, you have the ability to do that. It is Christ who works in you to produce good. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved unto good works in Christ Jesus. So he's praying and he's giving him a recommendation of what he's heard from many, many, many people. Hearing of your love and your faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and all his saints. Friends, you cannot say, I love Jesus and I don't like these people. It doesn't work that way. You love God and you love his people. That is how it works. How will the world know that you love him? If you love people. <laughs> if you love one another. If you care about the affairs of people then we shall know that you are indeed a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a, t a great testimony here from uh, Onesimus. He told him that this, this guy, he loves people. It, it, for sure we can attest of that. That the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. I think even the way he treated the slaves in his house was commendable. He loved them so dearly. Became a Christian and he said, man, if I have received such a great love from the Lord, why not make it overflow from people. Show people some love. Show them kindness. If you have people you have employed, pay them good salary. Treat them as human beings. Treat them well. So, still remember, Paul is writing this letter to a man who has been greatly offended. So even if you're bearing this offense, consider what Paul just wrote. <laughs> we, brother, we, you, there's a great testimony of how you love the Lord. And not just loving the Lord, all the saints in your house are refreshed by you. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Which is quite the opposite, you know. It's very hard to make people happy. <laughs> it's very hard. But it was commendable that the saints were refreshed by this brother Philemon. And then, what is going to happen? He's going to jump to the next section, which is a request for forgiveness and restoration. He's already introduced himself and say very nice words to this man. Perhaps those who will break <laughs> the walls. If he had said, man, I'm, I'm not going to forgive this man. I'm not, I'm going to, you know, sometimes we say words that we think are very kind, but they're not. You're like, I'm going to leave him to the Lord. <laughs> you know, the Lord is going to deal with him. No, that is bitterness. <laughs> hey, bitterness harbored in your heart like the Lord will deal with them. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't go that way. He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, I got the authority, I can <laughs> tell you to do this. Yet for love's sake, 
I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Stop right there. You're reading this, and perhaps you're like, you know, before he read it to the church, reading it to the family first, you know. <laughs> and his wife is probably looking at him like, you're going to read that to the church? <laughs> you're going to do it? Paul said you do it. <laughs> you know, you're, you're feeling a lot of rage and resentment and you know, the, these outbursts of anger. These things are coming to you. And you, you just commanded this guy for the good job he's doing, and now you're mentioning another person who is not fitting in this conversation, Onesimus. What does he say about him? He's my son. <laughs> Wait a moment. Whose son is Onesimus? I know him. He was a slave in this house, in my house. I know him better than you do, Paul. What you think is, like, Paul, this prison thing has messed your mind. <laughs> the things are not working well with your, your brain. Say, I, I, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. <laughs> He's my son. He's your slave. He's stolen from you. He's offended you. But you know what is happening right now? He's my son. I have begotten him. I have a testimony of who he is right now. Whatever was in the past, I think you'll have to ask the Lord to help you deal with it. But right now, he's a son in the faith. What, you, what, what would you do, church? Receiving a letter from the the man you love, Paul, and then the one who has offended you, Onesimus. How do you reconcile these things? Paul then gives a request to Philemon to finally, you know, bring up Onesimus, who has become Paul's son in, the, in chains. Paul has led Onesimus to dedicate his life and allegiance to Jesus. So both Paul and Onesimus are now family members in Jesus. And since he got born again, Onesimus has been serving Paul faithfully in prison because he's, he's aged, he's an old man. And he's being served even right there in prison. And though Paul wants to keep him around, he knows that this unresolved conflict with Philemon has to be reconciled, especially since they are both followers of Jesus Christ. So Paul asks that Philemon would receive Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but more as a beloved brother in the Lord. He took upon himself a very tall order. <laughs> you know, under the Roman law, Philemon had every legal right to have Onesimus punished or put in prison for a very long time. Very long time. And Paul is not asking him just merely forgive Onesimus, but to welcome him back 
into Colossae as an equal member of the family. Think about it. <laughs> Onesimus in prison, God born again, now he's serving the Lord and he's serving Paul in prison. And Paul is writing this letter and later we'll see that there were other brothers also who knew about these issues and testimony and this contention. And he's saying, hey, I know this man would be very profitable and he is profitable to me right now. Why? I am in prison and I'm an old man. I need him around. But because of the unresolved conflict, this is for the good. Receive him not as a slave, but as a fellow brother. Now think about it. Have you guys ever been offended <laughs> with people? Well, that probably is not a question because I know all of you have been offended. Amen? <laughs> we bear a lot of offense. We, we carry a lot of offenses in our hearts. It's either we have offended people or they have offended us greatly and we bear a lot of pain in our hearts. And as we go through these words, I don't know how the Lord is going to work it out in your heart, but there are some things that we ought to let go so that God will work in your life. I'm sending him back to you. Receive him. Say, that is my own heart. That is my own desire that you will receive this man. So think about it. The people who have offended you, people who have spoken ill of you, done horrible things, what you gonna do? This way, beyond kindness, this is something that is unheard of. During that time and season, freeing an enslaved person and treating them like family would mean upsetting the status quo of the Roman social order. You're offending everybody, not just the fold in Christ. But everyone, how do you do that? Why should Philemon do such a thing? At this point, Paul pulls a very brilliant move, recalling the key words of koinonia, the fellowship, the partnership that he mentioned in his opening prayer. He says that if you are truly a partner with me, welcome Onesimus as if it were me. <laughs> we are partners in the gospel, me and you. If so, do this to this man because he's a fellow partner too right now. Those are not easy things to take in. And now he continues to say, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. <laughs> Just like you, Paul, a prisoner, what do you got? <laughs> what do you have? This guy owes me a lot. You're going to pay it with your life? You say, put that on me. I'm going to pay. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. I will repay. 
And not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. <laughs> I don't know if Paul is being very crafty or... <laughs> you know, so this man owes you a lot of things. Write that on me. I'm going to pay for it. But as you're thinking about it, you owe me. <laughs> so who's going to pay who? <laughs> In fact, Paul says, you owe me even your life. <laughs> Paul is a very brilliant man. I, 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 I can't pull that out. <laughs> you know, some, you owe me, so it's, it's flat rate, Okay. <laughs> So we, you don't owe me, I don't owe you, so just treat him as a brother. <laughs> and maybe his son, Philemon's son, will be like, Dad, you never told us. You owe Paul a lot. <laughs> Tell us how much. We pay Paul so that this Onesimus guy will pay us because He's wronged us more. Remember, you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. And having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This Paul is a very crafty man. I believe he's filled with the Holy Spirit. But the way he's writing this letter, he, how would you defend your case? <laughs> I know you're going to forgive all this debt. I know you're going to bring him around. But, I know you're going to do more. <laughs> you're going to do more, right? It's like people have offended you, they have your debt, and you're canceling the debt by even adding them more money. <laughs> Who does that? Who does that? And it's like he, he's leaving him with not many options. Because he's saying, you know, having confidence in your obedience, I know that you obey God above all else. I know that you love the Lord. I know your kindness. I know all these things. I know through your obedience to the Lord, this is not going to be a big deal right now. It's not going to be. The Lord has been working in your life. You have given your, 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 yourself. You've given your house for the service of the kingdom. Don't let this one man destroy the joy of you receiving a lot of rewards from heaven. Treat him as a brother. I will repay anything. You know, within this request, we can see the heart of Paul's gospel message being acted out. For Paul, the gospel is about reconciliation. First of all, as he told the Corinthians, in the Lord, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting people's sins against them. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. He's forgiving people, he's bringing people back, and he's not counting all these wrongs. You've done this, you've done this, you've done this. I'm going to keep them on a record <laughs> so that I will judge you properly. As far as the east is from the west. 
He separated us from our sins. He forgives you. He forgives every one of us. And so, that is the gospel message. That God was reconciling the world to himself. Not counting people's sins against them. If he did, none of us would be born again. Because we have offended God greatly. And we do every other day. We continue with the offense. And in this situation, we see that Paul is playing out a Christ-like role. How so? That he will absorb the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoing and pay the cost himself. Who did that for us? Jesus Christ. Taking everything upon himself so that we are reconciled to the Father. That is exactly what Paul is doing right here. Also, that he can be reconciled. Anesimus and Philemon. So, in God's new family, people are neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised and circumcised, foreigners and civilized, slaves free. But Christ is all in all for everyone. Paul's letter to Philemon is powerful for so many reasons. Because it targets what is harbored in our hearts. The things that we can keep, yet in the outside, we tend to give a smile, right? We have perfected this nature of hiding things in our hearts. We know we carry things, we carry bitterness and forgiveness, very bad things, but we still meet people and try to hide them with a smile. God bless you, brother, but I can kill you. <laughs> I can shoot you right now. I'm so mad right now. <laughs> Friends, this is just one book, actually. I don't know. You know, if we'll be reading this more and more, maybe we'll learn to forgive more and more. Because this thing is hard. It's not like... It's not a lot of words. It's not a whole book. Just like a chapter. Speaking to the things that we hide in our hearts. Say, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. I see Paul again. So he began by saying, hey, I'm praying for you. I've been praying for you, always mentioning you. In other words, like, hey, do you do the same? <laughs> do you guys pray for me in prison? Or if you don't, please do. Because I want to come to you. I want to see you. And when I come, I want to witness the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. <laughs> I want to find you guys together. This, it seems to be a very simple word, but it kind of puts a lot of pressure in you to strive to do good. 
I want to come. Prepare a room for me. <laughs> if I don't die in prison, I want to come and see you people. Verses 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, in Christ Jesus greets you. Like who? Did, did you talk to people about it? <laughs> You mention this to other people, they know it. Oh man, what, what are they going to think about me? We, 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 fellow laborers, but they know this thing that I'm struggling with, this kind of pain. Because it was public and it was known, this needed to be read publicly so that things happened in the hearing of people. As do Mark, aristocrats, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. In other words, all these people that I'm mentioning, they know about it and they say, hello. <laughs> they know about it. You know, sometimes we feel ashamed when people know our bad side, right? Right? They say hello. They know about it. And finally he says this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. We're done here. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> as you're thinking about all these things, as you're trying to figure out the best way May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your heart as you're making this decision so that you make a very sober decision. Don't just do it because of the feelings, because these feelings will die and these feelings will lie to you. It won't be straight up. He wants you to do it right. This letter shows us that the implication of the good news about Jesus are extremely personal, but never private. The fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in Christ, it makes their master-slave relationship totally irrelevant right now. Because now they are partners in Christ. The family of Jesus' people, where all are equal recipients of God's grace, is a new kind of newness experienced in every community, as Paul talks about it in Col Colossians chapter 3. In this new life, people value and social status are no longer defined by race, gender, social, or economic class, but in Christ alone. We are equal partners, sharing together in God's healing mercy through Jesus Christ. And friends, perhaps those that have injured you, because I know you've been injured before. Perhaps it was your boss. Perhaps it's your husband. Perhaps it's your wife, your friend, your colleague at work, your children. Perhaps it's your church member. whoever they might be. Can you hear what the Lord is saying to you right now? Do you hear the voice of God speaking to you about these situations, about these issues? You know, the, there are many things that we can forget. Forget my phone in the house, 
forgot my wallet in the car, forgot a lot of many things we can forget. But the people who have offended us, we don't forget. Sometimes we can bring out, you know, sneaky, sneaky prayer. We're telling God that, God, if I've offended anyone, <laughs> if I have offended anyone, no, you have offended people. What God needs from you is just be honest. <laughs> you know, he knows it even when you're trying to hide it. You can't hide it. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Oh man, it's hard to break through. That is how these things run deep. Building walls around us. Someone offended you, you know, you, you, you planned your marriage and two days before that, the other party didn't show up. <laughs> they disappeared. Having a business deal, you signed it and they sneaked a page that you didn't see. Later, everything is eating you back. All you want to do is to kill people. Rage. Friends, I know we have been offended greatly. Even right now, some of us are just hurting big time. Like, how, how do I forgive people and forget? I, I don't know how you will ever forget. All I know is just you need to forgive. You might actually never forget it. How do I forget and I have marks in my body? <laughs> you hurt me. I see it. The far much more the things we see on our bodies, the things we keep in our hearts. They run deep. You know how you can know if you have forgiven people? If people greatly offended you? and they disappeared for years or for whatever time. You see them, and you don't have resentment, and you're happy to see them, you have forgiven them. <laughs> if you see them, and things cross your mind, <laughs> how you want to hurt them, what you want to do to them, Please take it to the Lord because you can kill them immediately. Take them to the Lord. He will help you. Tell the Lord, I thought I'd forgiven these people. <laughs> Please help me again. I need you. And I want to tell you for sure, sometimes those things take years. It can be a thorn in your flesh that you've got to beat it every day. You know what the Lord will say? My grace is sufficient for you. For when you're weak, my strength is made manifest in your life. Maybe it's a thorn in your flesh, I don't know. I know my thorn in the flesh. I know mine, for sure. I cannot deny it. And if I tell you, you guys will disappear out of this room. <laughs> God troubles, man. I got, I got issues. <laughs> But I take them to the Lord. He's gracious. He's forgiving. So friends, in all these days that God has given you life, do you run things by the Lord? Do you check up yourself in the Lord daily? Or you just go about your business and everything is fine? Have you been checking up yourself in the Lord lately? Because if you do, he will remind you of the things you need to let go. The things you need to just 
let it be. I have been offended, and I have offended people. <laughs> what am I going to do about it? Just say, well, the Lord will take care of it. Do you see how the Lord is taking care of it? He's telling Paul to send Onesimus to Philemon. That is how the Lord is taking care of it. <laughs> so maybe the Lord is sending people back in your life. Like, I don't like them. We know you don't like them. Do you think you're likable? <laughs> you don't. You don't. The, the Lord doesn't love us because we are likable. <laughs> I don't know how this would sound. But I don't like my wife because she's likable. <laughs> I have made a commitment to love her no matter what. In good times and bad times. It's commitment and it's loyalty. Period. Because if you depend on your feelings, they disappear sometimes and you don't know what to do. You're going to hurt each other. You know, we don't wake up every morning and feel like you don't like them and say, I actually don't like you today. <laughs> do people do that? So like, oh man, Lord, help my heart. There's something that is drawing my heart far away. Please help me. <laughs> Bring it back in order. Because if you leave me alone, I am gone. <laughs> Friends, I want you to bow your heads and think about those things in your heart that you're keeping and are not worth keeping. The things you harbor in your heart that you need to help, that you need help from the Lord as I bring the worship team to come. Sometimes the Lord speaks to us and we just harden our hearts. We don't want to let things go. By you letting things go, you're actually entering a very good season of your life where there is a lot of freedom. A lot of freedom. Whether it's your boss who offended you, your husband, your wife, your siblings, your colleagues, your fiancé, whatever it may be, whoever it might be, Jesus says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Given us a very good option. Lay down your burdens. Lay down all your heart. All who are broken, reach out to Him. And as we bow our head, if that is you, really. You need the Lord to fix it for you. Raise your hand, we'll pray together. You don't let the enemy play around with your mind, with your heart. Thank you for those hands. Oh Lord. 
Oh Lord, many, many, many people are hurting. Many, many people have things in their lives, in their hearts that only you can help them take away. I pray, God, that whatever the issues may be with their lives, all these people, I pray that your Holy Spirit will begin a work in their lives. I pray for a conviction of the Holy Spirit to let go of this pain. And if you lead these people back, I pray that you give them a refreshing time to reunite. And if you're sending us to go say sorry and apologize to the people we have wronged, I pray, oh God, that we'll find it easy to go do it. You didn't die at the cross because we were worthy of your cross. But you still died. Whatever the circumstance, I pray that we'll reach out to these situations and talk them out and pray about them and find healing and reconciliation from you, O oh God. I know through your Holy Spirit we can do even more to love these people properly as you have loved us, O oh God. So please help us today. As we walk this journey, I pray that the enemy will not play tricks with our minds. I pray, oh God, that your spirit will lead at every part of this way to, to forgive and to be forgiven. And so we ask of you, God. We ask of you that you would work in us. And at the end of it all, we are awaiting these great testimonies of what you're doing in our lives even right now because you're here. Our confidence is in you. Thank you, God. Thank you for blessing these people. Thank you for forgiving these people. Thank you for restoring all these people. It is by your grace. We thank you. And Lord, even as we serve you with our offerings today, may we not give grudgingly. Let's give wholeheartedly with joy in our hearts. A glorifying percentage of our finances. So we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.